Good morning. We're so glad you're joining us here for our worship services at Center Street Church. And we just want to invite you uh, to join with us in worshiping God together. Uh, Pastor Ashwin will be teaching from God's Word in Revelation 10. So please grab your Bible and join us. Also, next weekend is our Easter experience where we'll be celebrating Easter. And so if you're able to, we'd love to invite you to come join us in person at one of our five locations in and around the Calgary area here at our central campus in Airdrie, Bearspaw, South Calgary, or Bridgeland. And so we just want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. And God bless you as you seek and worship the Lord. Well, good morning. Welcome to Center Street Church. We're so glad that you are here joining with us. If you're a little late like me or if you're right on time, the Lord is glad that you are here. Um, we come together weekly to do this, to do this gathering for a very specific reason. We want to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Amen? That's why we fix our hearts on the word that is taught through the sermons. That is why we pour out our hearts and lives in surrender during the worship time and the songs and the singing, because we want to fix our hearts and lives, build them on Christ. He is our hope for this age and the next to come. And it says this in Psalm 27, and I just think it sums it up so well, why we gather in this house. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. So will you stand with me? Whatever our circumstance, whatever we're facing, we can worship our God who is constant and eternal. Let's put our hands together. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we will be quiet. We won't be quiet. We shout out your 
Since we were the beggars And now we're royalty We were the prisoners And now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted Redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise Cause we were the beggars And now we're royalty
His face I at last shall see To be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me Singing how marvelous, how wonderful And my song shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful Is my Savior's love for me Let's sing it Please join me in reading the word from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. But you, man of God, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without life Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit Father God, we praise you for your provision in all circumstances. We look to you for our support. Thank you for always providing just what we need in just the right time. God, you are eternal. You have no beginning. You have no end. You have an amazing capacity to see all and know all. And so we trust you as the eternal God, for there is no one like you. You are Yahweh. You are the great I am. There is no one higher or greater than you. And so today we bow at your feet, King of kings, Lord of lords, and we surrender to your greatness. God, we thank you that you're forgiving, that you're compassionate and slow to anger. You're gracious and abounding in love and faithfulness and maintaining love to thousands and thousands, forgiving wickedness and sin. When we understand who you are, God, we can't help but give you praise and worship. And would you be honored by our surrender to you today? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
How can we keep from singing God's praise? The Lord of heaven and earth, who gave his Son, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. How can we keep from singing your praise? May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Amen. Well, we are in a season of anticipation. Just yesterday, I was on Deerfoot, and I saw a man in a convertible with his top down, and he was excited for summer, which is not quite here yet. Our farmers are anticipating uh, this massive dump of snow that's coming this week, Uh, So that'll be good, but as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we anticipate and are excited about celebrating this Easter season and what Jesus has done for us. And I cannot believe that Easter, uh, Palm Sunday is already next weekend, and our Easter experience, and so uh, our Easter experience will be filled with great music and telling of the greatest story ever told as we reflect on the peace of God through Jesus and his death and resurrection. So please come join us for our Easter experience and please bring someone with you. Uh, Palm Sunday will also kick off our week of prayer at Center Street Church. We want to be a people of prayer 
a church of prayer, and prayer is so vital to our relationship with God, and so please uh, join us in devoting ourselves to prayer. And for that week of prayer, uh, you can text prayer at CSC to the number on the screen, and uh, you can receive, uh, receive daily prayer encouragements from Monday to Thursday. As well, here at Central Campus from Monday to Thursday, uh, following Palm Sunday, uh, you can join us uh, to pray in the evening at 7 p.m. Uh, for a time of prayer and reflection. And then on the Wednesday, there will be a prayer summit here at Central Campus at 7 o'clock. And so please join us for those things. As well, of course, Good Friday is coming, and we will have services at Central Campus here at 9 o'clock a.m. and 11 o'clock a.m. And uh, for those of you who are early birds, we invite you to join us for our sunrise service on on Easter Sunday at 6 o'clock a.m. That's a.m. And uh, that is on Nose Hill Park, uh, just off Edgemont Drive and Shaganapi. And there's uh, details on our website. You know, it's so hard to track all of these details and times. And so uh, we just invite you, please, uh, please join and receive our weekly campus email. And you can sign up for that on our website. And if you like text messages, uh, if you text ITK, which stands for in the know, ITK at CSC, uh, you can receive text messages if you send it to the number on the screen. On our website, you'll also find events such as Encounter God, which is an opportunity to grow closer in your relationship with Jesus, and there are many opportunities to serve on our website. And if you're looking for some opportunities this summer, we'd love for you to pray about and consider investing in our next generation and uh, joining us at CS Camps. You know, we worship God in so many ways. One of those is through our worship services, through singing songs of, of praise and adoration and worship. Uh, we worship God through serving, through reading Scripture, and also through giving. And Scripture says that we uh, love God because He first loved us. And I think it's the same with giving, that we are to give back to God because He first gave to us. And so God bless you as you give faithfully to God. And let's pray uh, this morning for our tithes and offerings. Father, thank you that you have given to us so generously. And God, as we give back to you a portion of what you have given us, just a portion, we pray that you would bless it, that you would use it for your kingdom, for your honor, for your glory, so that many more people would be introduced to Jesus and become fully devoted followers. And God, we pray that not only would you bless our tithes and offerings, but would you use our giving to take our mind and our hearts to be focused away from the things of this world, from our worldly possessions, from materialism, and would you soften and shape our hearts to invest in things that will last forever, that we would invest in treasure in heaven and not here on earth. God, I also ask uh, that you would be with Neil and the family of Bev Meyer, who passed away earlier this week. Would you give them comfort? Would you give them your peace that only you can give? Would they know your presence, your love, that you are with them? And God, I lift up to you, uh, Pastor Ashwin, this morning as he uh, teaches from your word from Revelation 10. God, would you use him? Would you use him, Father? Would you use your words, your scripture, to shape us to be more like Christ? We love you and give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Greetings, everyone. I want to welcome all of us at Center Street Church, those of us here at Center Campus, as well as those joining us from our campus in Bears Park, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and South Calgary. I also want to welcome those who are joining us online. Uh, today, we continue our study of the book of Revelation, and we will be focusing on Revelation chapter 10. Last weekend, we explored the sounding of the first six trumpets which serve as a wake-up call from God, calling people to repent and be in right relationship with Jesus. Now, we have an interlude between the sounding of the sixth and the seventh trumpet. 
Now, if you remember, there was a similar interlude between the opening of the sixth and the seventh seal. Now, after all the action, the interludes help us to catch our breath and take time to reflect. Or the use of apocalyptic language and the graphic portrayal of judgment in the book of Revelation can be overwhelming. So here's a question for us to ponder. How do we live as God's people in light of the end times? Knowing that there is coming a day when the world will come to an end and Jesus will return. What should Christians be doing now? Do we sell our home? Move to a remote location, a stockpile on food, gather arms and ammunition. How do we live in light of the return of Jesus? That's what we're going to talk about today. Some years ago, a radio preacher from California named Harold Camping made some bizarre predictions about the second coming of Jesus And it made the news. Harold studied the book of Revelation, was submerged in end time prophecy, did some number crunching, and came up with a date. May 21st, 2011. That's it. That would be the day of judgment. He was so sure. Over 5,000 advertising Billboards, huge billboards were hired. Pamphlets were distributed, prepping people for the imminent end that was coming. They spent nearly $100 million on ad campaigns and marketing. All listener-supported money. People even quit their jobs, sold their possessions so that they can contribute to the ministry. Well, the big day arrived and went by. Nothing happened on May 21st, 2011. The following day, the people who believed in Harold Camping and gave their money were all dejected. Well, the preacher revised the prophecy, saying he had been off by five months. And that also did not come to pass. And after all kinds of excuses, finally Harold Camping stated, we humbly acknowledge we were wrong about the timing and it only cost us hundred million dollars that is an example of how not to live in light of the end times see the book of revelation was not given to us so we can do the number crunching decode everything solve all the prophetic mysteries and come up with a date of jesus return no that's not the purpose of this book This book is a practical book. Revelation calls us to be better disciples of Jesus now. It urges us to live out our Christian commitment even when we face oppositions. The book inspires us to be rock solid in our conviction and living our lives fully devoted to Jesus and following Him faithfully no matter the times. Revelation issues a reminder just in case we forget that Jesus has already won and we are part of the winning side. So Christians are called to live confidently in light of the end times. That's the way to live the Christian life all through history. From the first generation of believers in the book of Acts all the way until the final generation that will see the visible return of Jesus. Our text for today is Revelation chapter 10, and we will glean some lessons from this text on how to live in light of the end times. So if you're physically able, would you please stand as we honor the reading of God's word, Revelation chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow about his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. 
he planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout, like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. And in the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It'll turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it'll be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Would you pray with me? Lord, once again, we acknowledge the inspiration of your word that you have spoken to us so clearly through the scripture. Now we pray that, Lord, that you will give us hearts that are humble and receptive to you, that we will not just hear these words, but like the Apostle John, we will assimilate these words and that these words will go into the very core of our being and it will produce hope and confidence. So we commit this time to you now. Speak to us in the power of your spirit. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. A mighty angel is portrayed here as handing a little scroll over to the Apostle John. Who is this angel? One thing we know, he's massive in size, way bigger than the Incredible Hulk. The angel's one foot is planted on the sea and the other on the land. Now, ever tried to do splits? And this is impressive. The angel is straddling the land and the sea. And he's robed in a cloud. In the Bible, the cloud is a vehicle on which God makes his appearance. He rides on the cloud. The angel's face shone like the sun. It's similar to the description of the risen Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. The angel's feet are like pillars of fire. Once again, Jesus is described in a similar way in Revelation 1. Some divine features are associated with this angel. So that has led some to conclude this angel here is a reference to Jesus. Now the only problem is, the beginning of verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Another mighty angel. Now that can't be a reference to Jesus. Because this angel here in Revelation 10 is similar to another mighty angel referenced earlier in Revelation. So it appears the angel is not Jesus, but the angel is representing Jesus, speaking on behalf of Jesus. Somehow he reflects the majesty and the sovereignty of Jesus. He speaks with the authority of Jesus like his ambassador. And when the angel spoke in a loud voice, like the voice of an like a voice of a lion, at the time. There were seven thunders. Listen to this in verse 4. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. 
Now, we don't know what's the message of the seven thunders. John was eager to write them down, but he's explicitly told not to. This is not to be revealed. Now, that tells us something. There are things that we don't know about the future. And God has not revealed everything to us. When folks like Harold Camping do the number crunching and think that they have solved the puzzle, they figured the date of Jesus' return, that is wrong. Precisely because they are working with incomplete information. When we make predictions regarding the future or even be dogmatic about our interpretation of Revelation that we are right and everybody else is wrong, then we need to be careful. If God intentionally withholds information so that we will depend on Him. If God knows a lot more about the future than you and I do. So Revelation is not to be treated like this mystery book that will give you all the details. That will give you a a script of the entire end times. God has purposefully not made everything plain to us. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words words of this law. There are some secret things that we don't need to know about. That's God's prerogative. We are called to walk by faith. That is why I don't have any desire to find out when Jesus will return. Instead, I want to live my life faithfully as though he can return any moment, because that's how we are called to live the Christian life. See, if God wanted us to know something, and it was essential for our faith, he would have made it plain. But if he deliberately left something out, that is because he wants us to live in humble dependence upon him. Speculating over and over about the end times, may not be profitable. Instead, focus on living for God while we are waiting. God is far more interested in that. One day when we stand before Jesus, He's not going to say, you figured the book of Revelation, you interpreted it correctly. Well done, my good and faithful servant. No. It's when we live our lives faithfully for Jesus. When we are Devoted disciples who share the love of Jesus with those who are around us. And we make the world a better place. That's what Jesus takes notice and he will commend you for it. So there's an element of mystery here in the book of Revelation. And even God has not given us everything. But at the same time, God has made some things known to us that we can hold on to and anchor our lives upon. There is an assurance here in the text. Look at verses 5 to 7. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it and the sea and all that is in it and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. God has a predetermined future when everything will come to an end. At the right time, Jesus will return. At the right time, history will come to an end. At the appointed time, all Christian believers will be vindicated. There will be no delays. Evil will be defeated. Christ will be exalted. And we will all be soon standing in His presence. And all that the prophets have told us in this book is true. God is faithful to every one of His promise. You can trust Him even when we don't comprehend everything. And when we look at the turmoil in our world, 
all the darkness that's out there. You may feel like I feel sometimes. Are God's purposes really going to prevail? What are the odds? The opposition seem to be too many. And we panic. And I want you to know, every generation of Christian believers have wrestled with these sort of questions. And the book of Revelation gives us a different lens to look at the world. Don't look through your natural eyes, but look through your spiritual eyes. For then you will realize Jesus has already won the victory. That's what discouraged and disillusioned believers need to know. That suffering will not be our final lot and portion, but we will reign with Jesus forever. There is no doubt whatsoever whether God's purposes will come to pass. That is something you and I don't have to fret about. You don't need to be anxious as to who will win. Jesus is the winner, hands down. And if you are his, then you belong to the winning side. That's how we live our lives in light of the end times. Not by plotting and arriving at the dates and charts to figure out everything. But we live with a confident assurance that we belong to a mission that simply cannot fail. Let's move ahead in the text and look at verses 8 to 10. And the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. So the heavenly voice asked the apostle John to take this little scroll from the hand of the angel. Now there's a similar experience that the prophet Ezekiel had in the Old Testament. Ezekiel was asked to eat the scroll and he testifies that it was as sweet as honey. But the contents of the scroll brought destruction upon the world. So like Ezekiel in the Old Testament, the Apostle John is now being confirmed in his prophetic role. He will receive the word of God that was sweet, but he will also have the unpleasant mandate of declaring it to others, this message of justice and execution of judgment. Now, what is this little scroll in Revelation 10 referring to? Well, perhaps this little scroll is the same scroll in Revelation 5 that we witnessed earlier. That was sealed. That scroll represents the plan of God to establish his kingdom. It remained sealed back in Revelation 5. And that's when, if you remember, John wept because he wasn't sure who is worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. And at the time, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah takes hold of the scroll. He breaks the seals and then unfolds the plan of God to restore all things. Now that the seals are broken, the scroll is no longer closed. Now it's open. So that may be the little scroll that the mighty angel gives to the Apostle John. Now the word for scroll in the original language is biblion, from which we get our word Bible. It simply means book. The scroll could be symbolic of the Bible. The written revelation of God that reveals to us His plans. Now, how else will we know God's purposes for the world except through this book? So the angel is asking John to eat the book, to ingest it. That's another way of saying, dwell on the word of God. 
ruminate on it. Let it influence the very core of your being. See, that's another principle of how we live in light of the end times. Rather than being paranoid, we spend time on the Word of God. And that renews us, strengthens us, builds us up as we feed on the Word of God. It's sweet as honey. It refreshes our soul. God's Word brings joy and delight to the believer. That's why we need to fall in love with the Bible. This is an incredible book. There is no book like this one. The psalmist who knew about this says in Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. See, the Bible is not a book that adorns our bookshelf, our coffee table. It's not just a a book for display. The Bible is not going to ward off evil spirits or serve as a lucky charm. It will not benefit you in any way if you're going to keep this book at a distance. It's only as you open the Bible and read it systematically on a daily basis, setting apart time in your day and make it a priority that this book will be a blessing to you. For then you will hear God speak so clearly. And his word will be a a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. We must feast on the truths of the Bible. Metabolize its teaching. For that's how we are nourished and we grow spiritually. If you have not established the habit of Bible reading, make it a priority. It will be one of the most spiritually rewarding things that you can engage in. Now, we have an introduction to reading the Bible class that's coming up. So if you're a new believer or if you're a beginner to Bible reading, check out our website for more information about this class and you can register for it. For those of us who already have the established habit of studying the Bible daily, here's my advice. The goal is is not to rush through the Bible and put a checkbox saying, I'm done with my Bible reading for the day. But it's about soaking on the words that you read. Sometimes just one word or a little phrase or one verse. Meditating on it. For that is how we draw the deeper meaning of the text. We dwell on it. Reflect on it. And then it becomes a revelation that impacts the core of our being. And take time during the day to reflect on what you read in the morning. Bring those truths back to the forefront of your mind during the day. The Word of God is sweeter than honey. It has the power to sustain you in the most difficult, challenging seasons of your life. It brings joy and delight. It reassures you and reaffirms the the solid truth on which we are building our lives. But interestingly, when John ate the scroll, it's like honey in his mouth, but it turns sour or bitter in his stomach. Now, why is it sour? The book is sour Because its message is not a bed of roses. It has some things to say that are countercultural. You know, if you believe and uphold those biblical convictions, you will face opposition, pushback, be disliked by others around you who don't agree with you. You will be labeled as judgmental. Yet we are encouraged not to keep the word of God to ourselves to share it with others around us. For what does the angel say here to John? Look at verses 10 and 11 again. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. 
John had tasted the word of God. And now he is being commissioned to be a prophetic witness to the world, to tell others about what is to come. But John was not just speaking merely from head knowledge. This was experiential knowledge. Having assimilated the word of God into his heart, he's now a first-hand witness to its countercultural message. And that is why John could look at the first century Roman Empire with all of its pomp and glory, and he could say, you're going down. You're not winning this battle. Caesar is not Lord. We will not give our allegiance and bow down to Caesar. Jesus is Lord. He alone deserves our praise and allegiance. See, that is the message of Revelation. Be radical disciples, no matter what generation or times we live in. Whether we are the first generation of believers, or we are the final generation of believers, or we are somewhere in between, this is our responsibility. We are prophetic witnesses. We speak of what we know, what we have experienced. We testify to the truth, even though it's countercultural, and the world around us is transformed as a result. John had seen the vision of the throne room of God, of the multitudes of believers from all language groups and people groups and ethnicities and backgrounds worshiping the Lamb. This is the culmination of all things. This is how it will all look like in the end. You know, as John looked at himself, the church of his time, After preaching the gospel for nearly 60 years, they were still a small, fledgling group. They were persecuted. They faced the threat of annihilation. And Nero had gone on a killing spree, getting rid of Christians. More and more persecution followed. It simply intensified. Most of the apostles by the time had been martyred. And John, as an old man, had been banished and he was living in isolation in the island of Patmos. You know, from a human point of view, everything looked bleak, hopeless. But the Word of God reminded John of an altogether different picture of the culmination of history that it would be a grand finish. So rather than being drowned by all the fears and anxieties over the gloom and doom of the world, John chose to place his faith on the Word of God and let that change everything inside of him. It doesn't matter what our circumstances may be like. We hold on to the truth of God's Word, believe what it says, and we proclaim its message with passion and conviction. That's how we live in light of the end times. One of the most prolific songwriters in the history of our Christian faith has been Fanny Crosby. She wrote over 9,000 spiritual songs and hymns, and some of the hymns are the best of our faith. We sing them even today. Fanny was blinded in both eyes when she was just six weeks old through a medical error. She lost her eyesight for no fault of hers. It was the mistake of a quack doctor. Rather than living in bitterness over her circumstances, Fanny just embraced her adversity. Her faith in Jesus changed everything. For she knew on the basis of God's word, she will not be blind forever. That her blindness is only temporary. When she was only eight years old, she wrote, Oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I'm resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, 
I cannot and I won't. At an older age, somebody remarked to Fanny, if you were born now, maybe they could have corrected your eye with the surgery and restored your sight. And Fanny's response was, do you know that the first thing I'm ever going to see is the face of Jesus? Fanny may have been blind. However, she could still visualize the beauty of Christ's blessings, often with more clarity than those who had sight. As a result, Fanny often spoke about sight in her hymns. I'll give you some examples. In the hymn, Blessed Assurance, there's a line that says, Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. And another phrase in the same hymn, Blessed Assurance, watching and waiting, looking about. And in the hymn, To God Be the Glory, Fanny wrote, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. That's how we're called to live in light of the end times. Times when, when we cannot see with our natural eyes. When our vision is simply blurred by our circumstances or the things that are happening in our world out there. In those moments, on the basis of God's truth, by faith, we see an alternate reality. We set our eyes on things above, and our belief about the future changes our present reality. So let us, like the Apostle John, like Fanny Crosby and countless faithful believers throughout history, Live confidently in light of the end times. And not by attempting to decipher every detail and predict dates and so on. Instead, rest in the blessed assurance that Jesus has won the victory. And we already have a foretaste of it. And it's only a matter of time before we will stand before His glorious presence in worship. What an incredible hope that floods our hearts and gives us the strength that we need to persevere. And the worship team will come now and lead us in a closing song and I'm going to ask all of us to stand. What's the lens that you're using to look at the world around you, to look at your own life, the pressing challenges and trials that you face. If we can have the lens of the book of Revelation, the victory that has already been won, and the hope that awaits us, that will change everything. So I want us to close our eyes right now and allow that alternate reality to sink deep inside of how the grand culmination of all things will be. And let that vision permeate and sink deep inside. And out of that springs forth the blessed assurance, a great confidence that we are safe and secure in the hands of Jesus. So let's reflect on that for a moment and then we'll join with our team in singing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus.
Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His in his blood perfect submission all is at rest I am my savior am happy and King above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Sing my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior.
join me in closing prayer. Lord, we thank you for the blessed assurance. The incredible confidence that we have in you, Jesus. That you have already won the victory. That the battle has been dealt with when you suffered and died on the cross. You rose from the dead and you have given us the victory. So we thank you that you have not withheld anything from us that we need to know in order to live confident lives. That on the basis of the truth of your word, that each one of us, no matter what we're going through in life right now, no matter what the times are out there, that we can live out of that assurance. That we can be bold in being prophetic witnesses of declaring and testifying of the things that we have seen and heard and experienced in our own lives. That truly there is no one like you, Jesus. You are the one and only Savior. And we will be bold in communicating that message, that countercultural message to the world around us. So would you strengthen us even times when we feel like weak or weary, that you will grant us the strength and the power that we need to persevere in this journey until the very end, until we see you face to face. So we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. And even as we all leave this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the sweet, unfailing fellowship of the Holy Spirit may rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward here. So if anybody has a prayer concern, you want words of encouragement, come forward and this team will love to minister to you. God bless you all. Some great words of challenge from Pastor Ashwin. Even though we don't know when Jesus will return to live life faithfully as though he will return any moment. Uh, to live life in humble dependence, fixing our eyes on Jesus, living confidently in that faith and, and uh, prioritizing Bible reading. So challenge you this week to jump into scripture, uh, read it every day. Uh, we'd love for you to join us next weekend for our Palm Sunday Easter experience services. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, please let us know in the chat. And we look forward to seeing you next week.